When our society discusses issues politely with each side seeking a peaceful resolution, everyone benefits. When the discussion is a highly polarized shouting match between people who just don't listen to each other, well, it's time for some roasted opinions. In the last year, there have been multiple incidents of cultural appropriation reported in the press, including the now infamous Chinese prom dress incident on Twitter. There has been a lot of rancorous debate about cultural appropriation. On one hand, the far left has raised a hue and cry over this. On the other hand, the far right denies that cultural appropriation exists. So let's get into this. Cultural appropriation is the presumptive use of cultural artifacts from minority cultures by members of the dominant culture. This canon does include the adoption of culturally specific practices in linguistic patterns. For instance, if a Caucasian in America were to wear a traditional Native American headdress, or to paint murals in the Australian Aboriginal style, or to get a tattoo with Chinese characters in it, this would be considered cultural appropriation. In fact, these three examples have all occurred and been announced in recent years. The implication is that the usage, adaptation, or adoption of these artifacts, practices, and linguistic patterns is involuntary and offensive to the minority culture. In some cases, it can be. The Boy Scouts of America has often run afoul of Native American tribes for appropriating their culture, such as making up dances in the style of certain tribes without consulting with those tribal councils to make certain that it would not offend them. Those who deny the existence of cultural appropriation often state that the examples given are actually cultural appreciation or cultural exchange. To illustrate what constitutes cultural appreciation and cultural exchange, I offer the example of my favorite local restaurant. The restaurant is owned by a Cantonese family and serves both common Americanized versions of Chinese cuisine like cashew chicken and general sorrel pork, along with authentic Cantonese Mandarin and Szechuan cooking. When I patronize this restaurant, I buy both authentic dishes and Americanized dishes because I like them. This is cultural appreciation. My appreciation may extend to learning how to say please and thank you in Cantonese, or even to ordering in Cantonese from the Cantonese menu that they have there. For my part, I like to cook at least as well as I like to eat. While I'm not a trained chef, I can turn out some pretty tasty dishes. Stir frying is a cooking technique that is Asian in origin and I have a wok. I use this wok to prepare stir fry dishes which often contain non-Asian ingredients. I may also reduce the amount of garlic and ginger in a dish or eliminate crushed pepper because my kids don't normally like heavily spiced food. This constitutes a cultural exchange to the cultural appropriation deniers. I have adopted and adapted this cooking technique to make food which my family enjoys whether authentic Chinese cuisine or not. If every cultural artifact is appreciated, then there can be no cultural appropriation, right? Well, I believe that there is cultural appropriation, but not nearly as much as is cited by the far left. Oddly enough, the term cultural appropriation has been appropriated by them. My purchase of authentic Chinese food and my use of stir-fry cooking techniques are legitimate byproducts of cultural interaction with other Americans of Chinese descent that brought their culture with them. And this is important. Neither of these things have any intended derogatory aspect to them and do not reinforce racial stereotypes, so they are not cultural appropriation. The owners of this restaurant adapted and adopted as much culture from Americans of European descent as my family and adopted from them, perhaps more in fact since they learned our language, legal system, and customs. They serve Cantonese food, yes, but they also serve Mongolian, Japanese, Korean, and Thai food at the restaurant. My eldest son really enjoys their sushi. My daughter usually orders either pad thai or udon. My middle son eats lo mein, and my youngest enjoys deep fried cashew chicken, which oddly enough was invented by David Liang, an immigrant from Guangdong, China, who owned Liang's Tea House in Springfield, Missouri. While the original restaurant closed in the 1990s, his son opened Liang's Asian Diner in Springfield, where they still make cashew chicken using his father's original recipe. Dozens of restaurants in this area serve their own version of this dish as well, although in my opinion, theirs is not quite as tasty as Liang's original. This is an example of cultural exchange and even cultural integration, and in my opinion, these are good things. The local culture around Springfield, Missouri is richer because of this, but I guess that there are some who would decry this dish as cultural appropriation. 
especially if they knew that many of the restaurants have no Chinese employees at all. After all, a couple of women from Portland, Oregon lost their authentic Mexican burrito business after it was discovered that they had <gasps> traveled to Mexico to learn authentic cooking techniques from cooks with which they stood almost no chance of ever competing against. Cook's Burritos was forced out of business by people who claimed that the owners were racist for culturally appropriating burrito recipes and cooking methods. I've read a few articles about Kook's Burritos, and honestly, I have concluded that the biggest problem that this business had was that it was serving authentic Mexican food without being owned and operated by authentic Mexicans. Then just about a year later, a teenager purchased a red Changsam from a vintage clothing store and wore it to a prom in Utah. When she posted pictures on social media, it didn't take long before someone started screaming about it on Twitter. Evidently, wearing a traditional Chinese formal dress to a formal occasion is not appropriate if one is not Chinese. His protest rapidly turned into a snarling backlash against the teenager who laudably responded with, It's just a dress, instead of abandoning social media altogether. That's right, those who decried her actions as cultural appropriation were trolling her hardcore, trying to bully a teenager off of social media altogether. Um, no. Just... No. Shall we eliminate all cultural exchange and or appreciation? Fine. Let's list a few things that would change drastically. Literature would, of course, have to be segregated by country of origin, so Americans could not read anything that was written by a non-American. Bye-bye Shakespeare. So long, Voltaire. See you later, Tolstoy. The Thousand and One Arabian Nights? Gone. Dead of the Epic of Gilgamesh, The Journey to the West, and the Bhagavad Gita. Harry Potter, The Lord of the Rings, The Chronicles of Narnia, all British and thus not allowed in America. What about music? The Beatles, ABBA, Ace of Base, Gautier, and many others just hit the band in the USA list. Size Gangnam Style is K-pop, and all K-pop is forbidden. Nearly the entire classical music catalog is unavailable. Only American dancing is allowed, so nearly every form of dance is gone. Only American visual art is permitted, so while we get to keep Jackson Pollock, Grant Wood, Georgia O'Keeffe, and some others, we lose Monet, Manet, Van Gogh, Rembrandt, Munch, Michelangelo, Da Vinci, and thousands more. The Lascaux Caves, the oldest known art, and the Dreamtime art of the Australian Aboriginals. Nope, you can't look at it lest you be influenced by it and appropriate that culture. And this is just the beginning, my friends. Every technique and every artist who survived the first round of purges must now be scrutinized for non-American influences. Oil and acrylic painting are European techniques. Watercolor is Asian in origin. Take every last painting down which uses these media and don't forget to move all of the art which uses brush strokes, perspective lines, stylistic choices, or materials developed outside of America. Now that literature is strictly American, we must eliminate all of the borrowed words and phrases. Unfortunately, we speak English and at least 80% of English vocabulary is borrowed from other languages. So, we will have to invent a new language to teach everyone and ban the use of English. We already have problems communicating in English. How much worse will that become when we lose most of the language? There goes the rest of dance, the theater, motion pictures, television, entertainment, really, since it borrows so much from other cultures. And there we have it. We empty the museums and libraries, shut down the festivals, tear down every building with architecture influenced by foreign cultures, repaint everything else in colors that are American in origin, and stop speaking to each other except for the minimum necessary to develop a culturally isolated language called American, which borrows nothing from any non-American culture. But wait, American is the national culture. There are regional cultures. Californians may enjoy California culture, but New York would be wrong to do so. The Midwest may only enjoy Midwestern culture, the South can engage in Southern culture, but nothing else, and so on. Then there are all the contributory subcultures, problematic so we really must isolate them from each other and ban anything that shows a mixture of cultural influences. Congratulations! In order to avoid cultural appropriation, we have now made it impossible to appreciate culture and removed any examples of possible cultural appropriation. We cannot speak to each other. We are stuck eating bland, dull food. We have no entertainment left. We have massive building projects ongoing to replace all the appropriated architecture. And our country is isolationist to the core. But we're safe from cultural appropriation. And that's where my opinion comes in, really. Cultural appropriation is not the same thing as cultural appreciation, cultural influence, or cultural exchange. Appropriation only occurs when there is reinforcement of bigotry against the minority cultures, something that happens when the dominant culture is engaging in cultural imperialism 
not cultural integration or even the multiculturalism which exists all over the Western world. Appropriation only happens if it touches on the sacred cows of another culture. Sacred cows, a phrase derived from the veneration of cattle in the Hindu religion in India. Derived or appropriated? Hmm. Now that's just my opinion and you don't have to agree with it at all. In fact, I'd love to hear what your opinion is as well. So go ahead and like or dislike the video. If you have something to say, leave a comment. If you are interested in hearing what other opinions I have, click the button and ring the bell so that you will be notified when my next video hits. Remember that you can't just hit that bell icon, you have to select all. I plan to post a new video every Saturday at noon central so watch this space.